So, welcome back everybody to the first afternoon session. Um, this one is about implicits, which is kind of a hot topic right now, it seems. And the first presentation is a demo by uh, Nada and by Tiak. Um, and they show us about implicits in practice in Scala. All right, yeah, thanks Andreas. And uh, so, uh, uh, we've been working on Scala for quite some time. It's really a great honor to be considered uh, a member of the NL family. So we're very happy to do a demo here. And uh, yeah, so, um, so this is in, in Scala. Um, there's, there's essentially two flavors. Um, so I have a list of three here. So we have implicit conversions and uh, those are served by the compiler, whenever there is an expected type, and the actual type of the expression does not match when the compiler will try to insert the conversion. Then the okay. So then the compiler will try to insert the, the conversion to the expected type. And uh, there's a little bit of um, implicit sugar over this, so we can uh, we also have implicit classes which give a more uh, yeah, way to just say what an implicit class and it adds certain methods to an existing type. We're going to show an example for all of this. And then there's implicit parameters, and uh, this is really Scala's way of modeling something that would be done in, in using type classes in Haskell, only that it's uh, a bit more flexible, <coughs> which comes with certain pros and cons, I would say. And with that, we're going to jump to code and uh, actually look at how this works in practice. And so just one thing, so we would really like this to be a bit interactive, so whenever you have uh, questions or remarks or just said, hey, can we change it in a certain way to see how that works, then uh, just, uh, just shout and try to recover that. Alright, so I will start by showing the, the first kind of implicit, which is implicit conversion. And the use case here is that we have this complex class, and so I can readily, uh, yeah. readily multiply uh, two complex numbers. So. And then here, um, if we look, we, we see everything combines, and we see the, the, print, the print statement. Now, what would be nice is if I could actually also just use integers. <coughs> so in this case, I would want to, for example, do this. And out of the box, you would actually get uh, an error because, well, we, we have an int and we require a complex number. And this is because the, the multiplication me um, method here takes a, a complex number in this complex class. So the easiest thing we can do is just write um, a, a method that converts from, from an integer and returns a complex. And actually, I, could, I don't really need to give the type here, but I'm just uh, being explicit. So I could, do, uh, I could do this. And now I could call this from int method here, and of course, everything should, uh, should work. But the idea now is that if I make this conversion implicit, then I don't, I don't need to call it explicitly anymore. I can just write this, and things will, will still, still work. And one thing that's interesting is if I, if I write it the other way around, so three times <coughs> complex, so um, who thinks this will work? <laughs> well, actually it does. <laughs> and so the, the reason it does is that we, we're kind of also doing expected type on the object field. So here the idea is that when we, when we use um, when we use the multi, when the, the, the type checker first goes and see, okay, this is an int, and I look at the multiply method on int, I don't see anything that expects um, a complex number there. But what I do instead is, I will, if I convert this int, this three to a complex number, then this method applies. And so it does this by, by analyzing kind of what is the expected uh, parameter type of this, uh, of this times method, some sort of structural, um, type expectation. So this is nice because um, uh, it, it actually works rather seamlessly with also um, object selection, and, uh, field selection, and method application. 
now for for um, a, a, a common a common um, I would say maybe probably the motivation also for adding this implicit conversion is this pimp my library pattern. So the idea is that since since Java, since Scala has to interpret interpret with Java, sometimes you you might want to use uh, these um, these these Java utilities, but you want to do use them in a more functional way. So for example, here there is this um, uh, string tokenizer from Java. And I, will, I, I have this all to list method that basically just converts it to a, to a list at the end. And what I would like to do is, if I have some tokenizer, I would like to be able to do print ls all like this, for example. And so I can do this by, by adding this implicit class, which is really just sugar for the implicit conversion we saw before. So the idea is like, it's as if I had written an implicit conversion from from this here, from this Java string tokenizer to this pimped operation class. And so these methods are provided. So with this implicit class, if I do this, I actually get um, this, uh, uh, I actually get the conversion to Java. And here I wanted to show an example where it's actually quite common that you would want to, to use a more functional pattern. So I could do like uh, all and maybe, maybe take the, maybe take the length of each thing. I, I, in Scala, I could actually probably just write this. Now, that's, that's also nice. I mean, in, in some sense, you can see that it worked well with overall resolution. But I just want to point out that sometimes it's also tricky. So if I change this pimp um, import to something where you, you see that the two implicit classes are actually separate. So there is this whole method in one and this whole method in another. I mean, you, you could expect that this would still work because in some sense there's a, um, in this one, I mean, maybe, maybe you, you could think it, it would work because it worked in the first case, but here if I change this to implicit ambiguous, I actually would get an error. Um, because uh, I get a sort of ambiguous error because it doesn't really know whether it should call this method or that one. Okay, so I just change it back to something green, and I will let <coughs> continue with some uh, more complex patterns. So the next uh, section is all about uh, implicit parameters, and as I mentioned in the intro, this is really the um, the pattern for modeling things like uh, yeah, what one would do with type classes in, in Haskell. Um, only that in, in Scala we don't have type classes really as a first class entity in the language, so we're really uh, using this mix of object-oriented and functional concepts here and just define our type class instances or dictionaries as regular classes here. So if we want to implement a, a type class uh, for ordering, then uh, this is how we do it. I'm just going to switch to my editor here. There we go. So we have a, an abstract class ordering which has a compare method and then we can provide concrete instances for integers and strings, right? So um, we create an, an object int ordering that is the expense ordering of int. And here we have this keyword implicit that uh, whenever we're looking for an implicit ordering instance for integer types, then this object is eligible for resolution. Right? Just to do some sanity checking, we can have a little test here and uh, directly call the compare method on the object. And uh, but something slightly more interesting, let's go and implement this little quicksort method here. And uh, this is how, how we might write the uh, functional implementation in Scala. And you can already see that we're using the ordering type class here. Right? And this is actually, again, just syntactic sugar, this uh, colon notation. Um, so we can write it in a slightly different way. We can just say quicksort of type t and uh, now we have, have an implicit parameter of type ordering. So this is uh, completely equivalent. And uh, so since this is just an um, irregular method parameter, I can use it like this, right? So whenever I <coughs> access my, my type class instance, I just uh, use the name of this way. Right? So this should hopefully compile here. Okay, there we go. Um, but let's revert this change and go back to the version where we had this uh, more explicit notation, right? So now we don't have an explicit uh, object anymore that we can access, so somehow we need to get at it. 
And this is where we're using this uh, ordering function here, which we can define like this. Right? So um, as I said, the, the colon ordering notation is just syntactic sugar, so we de can define a little helper method um, that just makes this explicit and returns the object. Right? And this is what, what we're using above here. And uh, here we've done it for a specific kind of uh, implicit parameter, but we can also do it in a very generic way. We can just introduce this method implicitly of type T, and whenever we have an implicit of type T, it will just return it. Right? So we could the, the ordering implementation, we could uh, again write like this if we want t ordering and then say this is implicit, implicitly of ordering of t. <laughs> there we go. So one core difference to, to Haskell is first that um, there's no global namespace for these type of instances. Right? So we can uh, since these are just classes and classes can be arbitrarily nested in Scala, we can essentially put them anywhere and import them from anywhere uh, and so on. And that also means we can have multiple applicable uh, implementations. So for example, uh, for ordering, we might want to say, well, I only define my base ordering, which goes from smallest to largest, but I might want to reverse the direction. And here's how we can do it. So we just define this, this method reverse, it takes an ordering, and it ret returns a new ordering um, that just uh, negates the, the result of the comparison. So this is of course no longer implicit um, because we would have an ambiguity conflict here. Um, but we can we can pass the the uh, uh, type class instances uh, explicitly if we want to. So here we have uh, <coughs> yeah, we have just a sanity check for the ordering thing, right? So this goes from smallest to largest. And now if I do I pass an explicit parameter um, with reverse of int ordering, then I get the uh, largest to smallest order. Right. And uh, well, this is all using this kind of functional notation, so reverse of int ordering. Um, but again, we can use this uh, film high library pattern uh, to use a more object oriented style with dot notation. So here I use an implicit class rich list and I put the quick sort method in there. And I also have a rich order <coughs> of the reverse method. And uh, then I can, can use it like this. So this looks just like as if Quicksort <coughs> was a built-in method on, on all the lists. Yeah. So I can just do So on the, on the Quicksort one, a couple of about around line 110 or something, just up a bit. Uh, that one, 106. So why are you passing it? Like sort of, is that a curried notation there? Or what, what's happening there? Yes. So uh, that's a curried notation. and. Um, as I showed previously here, so a method in Scala can have multiple parameter lists, yeah. right? And uh, the rule is that implicits uh, need to come last, and they come in. They all come in their own uh, parameter list. Do you know the rationale for why they implicitly come last, or I mean? Yes, because you can leave them off, right? And um, that's sort of yeah. I think. Well, I guess you could do it in the in the middle as well, but then it would be sort of if you have three arguments and in the middle there's an implicit, then it's no longer clear whether you are leaving that one off or not. Because Scala also has default arguments which can can be left off as well. So if I would write something like x s and uh, well maybe maybe the default is is nil, then uh, this would be the good space. So if you use quicksort as a higher order uh, as, as a function value, okay, yes. without applying it to anything. There's still going to be an implied implicit at each syntactic use of the quick sort value. So only when the method is applied. But if I use it as a as a higher order function, there will be eta expansion basically. So right. So there is an implicit uh, it's, it's eta expansion, and then and, yeah. and you make a good point about bringing higher order function because indeed, if you're returning a function, it's a bit ambiguous whether you actually meant to have the, the simplicity or not. And yeah. we will show that this is. This is a, also a syntactic flow that causes Yeah, so this is actually my, my next example. So just <coughs> to wrap this up, I, I can use dot quicksort and here I can use in ordering dot reverse again by using combining various kinds of implicits. But this is actually the point about um, since these are just function arguments, right? Um, lists, I, I can use any list as a, as a function if I want. And um, 
the, the use for that is I want to access an element by its numeric index, right? So here I want to get element two of this list, 29381, right? And that will give me three. But when I do, um, just point this out, you can see the, the error. So if I do access zero dot quick sort, and then access the uh, element by its numeric index, then I will get, the, get this error here, right? Because I'm passing two at the position where the ordering instance is. Right, so what I need to do in this case is I need to introduce a new, introduce a new variable here. I need to say y s equals x s zero quick sort, and then I can do uh, y s two. Will it slice the parentheses? Is that a round expression? Where you, where you just had, where you just do the replacement of y s? Do you have the parentheses around it? Uh, let's try it. <laughs> Hang on, could you describe that again? Why did that work? <laughs> <laughs> so let's try this one. No, no that doesn't work. One thing that does work is uh, since. So, hey, could you describe <laughs> that? Why, why didn't it work before you put the val in? Why didn't it work? Yeah. Well, so this is the, this is the type error, right? Your this, is without, this is without the parentheses around the excess. No. Yeah, so the parentheses are just removed during parsing, okay. right? So the, the type checker doesn't see them anymore. So one thing I can do, since, since functions are just uh, objects in Scala with a single apply method, I can insert an explicit reply call. Let's try if that works. Ah, yeah, okay, so I got another error over here. Another one? Yeah. yeah, so this works. Right, so if I use if I use apply, then we're good. Wait, 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 we can also change the so I don't have to I don't have to put the dot if I don't want to like this. Oh no, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But maybe if I, if I do it. So um so yeah. Yeah. So, 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 the, um, do you does the, do the development environments give tend to give feedback about like what are the implicits uh, being inserted? Yeah, so if I were using Eclipse, then uh, there would be a key combination or a mouse over which would show me implicits in scope, for example. Okay. Uh, so implicits in scope and the resolution of implicits at a particular point. So if I hovered over like just one of the quick sorts where I don't give an explicit, or, or here, for example, would it tell me, oh, the, the implied ordering is you know, forwards or something? Yeah, so back the last time when I used Eclipse, it didn't do that. It might have changed in the meantime. I, So uh, by, by dropping this sort of, by having a, a global, um, so, so no longer having a global namespace of type, of type yeah. classes, you lose a consistency property yeah. where you know order of t, if you see order of t, you know it's the same order, yeah. order of strings is the same order of strings everywhere. Um, does that matter? I don't know. So this is one, one criticism that is, that is levied against this model, of course, that you say, well, I have a, an ordered set. Right, and I, ha I have two ordered sets and I want to build the union, yeah. right? then if I might have different ordering instances, then that might not work out. Yeah. Or put something inconsistent. Um, I don't know how big a problem that is in practice. I think it's just something one needs to be aware of. For the fourth, you view this as a big problem. We do our collection process when we construct, uh, say, a map that gives three type parameters. The type of key the type of data and a unique identifier of the sort. Mm -hmm. And there are like real bugs that we have in production software because we we can screw it. So that so that, that might be real thing. Yeah. That that same technique could be used in Scala, presumably. You could give an extra type parameter on your set and map types to make sure that they're tracking the the yeah, yeah, we to those but, yeah. the but to me, that's that's sort of uh, like a question of design patterns, right? So it's like you need to be aware of when you're building the software and sort of figure out, okay, here's, here's like a pattern we use to, to deal with these cases. Yeah, but on, 
the other hand, it's like you have, uh, you want to have multiple notions of order. Like there's no one ordering that uh, specifically can type like the one that I showed you. Yeah, so that is one So, so my, our goal here is, let's just present what we have discovered. Right? There are certain design decisions that have been made, and um, I mean, the floor is open for discussion, of course, if that's the right model. But, um, I, yeah, I think my specific question was, did you get a feeling from the Scala community how often it mattered? Uh, or I don't hear any complaints. Mm -hmm. so, my impression is that uh, people coming from the Haskell side, I'm much more surprised by this and a little troubled, of course, because they're used to, to having uh, this consistency. But then people coming more from the Java side, of course, they, for them, I mean, it's actually they, 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 they have a blank slate with respect to that. Yes. Yeah. Um, but the other thing is, we, in, in some cases, we also use implicit, where it would be completely meaningless to use them if they were the same. So, for example, we can use them for, for getting source context information. And in that case, the, the whole point is that you want to have different, different source ones in different places. So some patterns actually uh, exploit this. I see. Thanks. Um, that actually might be a good, uh, a good point to talk about um, one use in the, in the collection library where we, we definitely need different different instances, right? And the, the Scala type system has subtyping, so the rule is we pick the most specific implicit that is available. So for example, the Scala collection library has this type bit set, right? And it's a special kind of sets that of course only applies to integers. So it, this is actually a, a, a subtype of set of, of it, right? But now what I can do is I can say, well, I create a second set and take the first one and just map the elements x to 2 times x, right, so that works. And actually the, the result type of this is again the, the bit set. So let's try something different. Let's convert every element to a string. And then the result type of this, of course, will no longer be a bit set, right? Because, well, it doesn't really make sense to uh, be strings as index indexes. So what I get is just a set of, of string here. And uh, so this is actually, that took a lot of time to get this design right here. And <coughs> the way this works is that in the definition of, uh, yeah, of set like, which is the, the class of trait that implements this functionality. So there's a, a quite a bit going on here. Um, but I <coughs> would like to point to this definition of map. Um, it takes a function, of course, from A to B, but it also takes an implicit can build from object. Right? And what this means is that given a collection of type this with elements of type B, I can build a collection of type that. Right? And uh, yeah, so this is the, the class definition of can build from. And basically what this means is, um, given a collection of type from, I can create a builder object um, that takes elements of type lm and builds a collection of type two. Right? So this is something where I can add element to and then get the, get the result. <coughs> and now we, we essentially, so we, we really rely on having multiple applicable instances here, right? So, uh, for the bit set case, I could use the, the can build from instance that builds a set of int from a set of int, um, but the one uh, that builds a bit set from a bit set is more specific. Right? So that one is picked by, uh, by implicit resolution here. Uh, so specificity uh, depends on a, on a couple of things. It depends on the uh, order of imports, it depends where it is declared, and it depends on, since we have subtyping, it depends on uh, yeah, basically the Java overloading resolution rules, like uh, which type of particular method call matches, matches this person. 
Do you want to, want to say, say a few words about driving out of time? How much time do you have? Okay, so I, I just wanted to point this uh, one example because Leo, Leo White uh, uh, was wondering if this would work. So, I mean, the idea is that you, you have, say, a default implementation for string, and then you have one which takes an implicit, uh, an implicit function that that might get you the same type depending on how it's instantiated. And he was wondering that, well, in this case, the, the generate default wouldn't actually work for a string because we don't have such an implicit function. And he was wondering whether it still works in Scala, so it does. And we will push to, to GitHub something which, which shows a, little, a few more use cases like this that could be interesting for, for compiling. And finally, just to, to wrap up, um, we, um, like recently because uh, there are some also interesting things that, that are happening now in, in Scala with macros. And one thing that's interesting is that you can actually like, um, uh, decide on whether an implicit is available or not at compile time. And this can be useful, say, to, to create materializers for new to Yeah, so, so the idea is that, well, with, with implicits, we can uh, when defining your implicit, it's completely crazy, so of course you shouldn't do that. But more, more generally, it's, I think the problem is really when, when the, the people using the implicit are not the same as the people who, who, wrote, them, uh, who wrote them, and this often happens in, in library development. And I, I would say like this, so, so then if you get, if you get a like implicit not found error, as a user that might be completely not in, in the domain in which you are. So Scala actually mitigates this, and already, say, in the collection library, there are, there are some uh, examples where, where we... Let's do yeah, so there are some examples in the, in the collection library where we... Uh, in, in two cases. So in one, we simplify the use case. So like the... the yeah, oh no, the, just, I, I just want to show the as the, the, the documentation thing. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the documentation for, oops, no, not your fault. Anyway, if you look at the documentation, you wouldn't get the full signature with all these implicits, you would get a simplified use case. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you could actually go and look at the, the full signature, but by default it's not there because there was, of course, a lot of trolling around there. Look how complicated is the map signature and things like this. And on the other hand, there's also a, a, another mechanism where you can add this at implicit not found annotation as a library writer, so that if um, if if if, the, if such an error is triggered, you can specify an error message in the domain of the of the. Domain. And so this is used uh, heavily in the collection. And, uh, yeah, we'll have these two. Thank you. So let's thank you.